are. Uh, Judge Kane, uh, we were talking about uh, time you spent in civil practice with the law firm Home Roberts and Owen in the 1970s before you came up became a federal judge and we discussed the clerky power litigation that brought you to that firm. Uh, what other kinds of litigation did you do there? Well, I, uh, I did general litigation, but the things I tended to focus on were one was construction law. We did uh, a, a number of uh, very large, complex uh, cases involving uh, utilities and hydroelectric plants, things of that nature, and I uh, did those with uh, Pete Holm and Ed Benton were the two that I worked with on those cases. Then uh, I did some work with uh, Dick Shrepperman, another partner on the Colorado Milk Producers Association, and uh, there were some, oh, not Sherman Act, but there were some commercial price cases that involved uh, uh, the car and milk producers. But the thing that I did the most, that I liked the most, was uh, uh, I represented uh, Channel 4 TV station, and I represented, uh, along with Davis, Graham, and Stubbs, represented uh, the Mullins Broadcasting Company, and because there was a possible conflict, I represented the, uh, the CEO and the uh, chief operating officer there. Uh, Al Flanagan was the CEO and uh, Charlie, uh, I can't think of his last name, was the, uh, uh, the chief operation officer. And we had a uh, Channel 9, it was a, a, a very lengthy, uh, high profile case involving a, uh, a guy that had a, a TV show and they canceled it and he sued and uh, we represented uh, uh, the channel and, and he was suing Flanagan and this, uh, Charlie personally as well. So I did that and that got me into that plus representing Channel 4 uh, into what was going on at the time with a lot of uh, a lot of criminal defense attorneys were trying to subpoena the outtakes from television camera news coverage and radio coverage, the tapes. The outtakes are the things that the cameraman photographs and then he cuts it before it gets put on the screen. And uh, they wanted to see the outtakes to see if there's prejudicial press re coverage and that sort of thing. And uh, the uh, media wanted to fight that because it was uh, an intrusion in, into the uh, uh, the artist's work, the, the photographer or the journalist, and so uh, we had a lot of these gag orders that we uh, we handled, and I did those, and I would uh, uh, there'd be a, a case a lot of times with my former employer Walter Garash uh, representing the defendant, and we would move. Uh, for a protective order or to quash a subpoena, that sort of thing. And uh, that led me to uh, represent a newspaper in Colorado Springs, the Colorado Springs Sun, and uh, there was a libel case. And uh, I tried that case, and uh, the jury returned a verdict for the plaintiffs. We took it up on appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court. This is kind of a funny thing, but I was arguing a specific point of law that when a private individual becomes involved in a matter of public importance, New York Times versus Sullivan applies. And that hadn't been the law in Colorado at the time. So I argued that point and the, the Colorado Supreme Court agreed. But as those things are, uh, it was, I think there's seven people on that court and it was a four to three decision because they wanted the plaintiffs, this man and his wife had an antique store and they thought they should recover. So uh, it was a, the, the judgment was affirmed and I was pretty upset and I was going in to argue a, a motion for a, a petition for rehearing and I saw then Chief Justice Eddie Pringle and he says, John, he says, you won. 
And he says, we adopted the rule of law that you wanted. He says, it took heaven and hell for me to get that. But he says, that's the rule of law in Colorado now. You won. And I said, well, my clients don't think I did. I said, he says, well, he says, sometimes a lawyer wins a case, the client loses. <laughs> so, but uh, from that case, I started getting some daily newspaper uh, work with the Colorado Springs Sun. And then uh, I think there was one matter, if memory serves, with the uh, Pueblo chieftain. They had a lawyer in Pueblo and he called me and I came in on something. And then uh, I got to meet, which came into play much later, but uh, Morley Ballantyne, who was the owner of the Durango Herald. And uh, I represented uh, the Durango Herald on just, a, again, a minor matter, but from there, uh, I became uh, one of the attorneys who represented the Colorado Press Association. And from there, the Colorado Broadcasters Association. So I did a lot of that kind of, of uh, work in uh, First Amendment law. And as it happened, I was in, uh, along with Tom Kelly, who represented the Denver Post, uh, we were in the courtroom in Aspen on the day that uh, the celebrated uh, serial killer Ted Bundy jumped out the window and escaped. And uh, we were there arguing on a gag order in front of uh, the district judge at that time was George Lohr, who later became a Colorado Supreme Court Justice. But the uh, United States Supreme Court had just come out at that time with the decision of Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart. And uh, it was all a the follow-up from uh, Shepard against Maxwell and excessive news coverage and Nebraska Press versus Stewart allowed for gag orders and set the criteria for them. And uh, so we were, they said that, that, that Shepard versus Maxwell had caused courts to restrain the press too much. And so we were arguing for more access on the Bundy case and uh, I cited Nebraska Press versus Stewart, and Judge Lohr said, well, I haven't read it yet, and as a good judge should, he declared a recess so he could go in and read the opinion. And while we were waiting for him to read the opinion, uh, we went out in the hall to have a cigarette, and uh, Bundy jumped out of the window of the courtroom, and <laughs> escaped. So, he exercises <laughs> First Amendment He right. exercised his uh, paratrooper <laughs> amendment rights. So the second floor, he jumped out of the second floor. In uh, fact, it was kind of funny because a, a, a guy that was clearly Australian came in, and it was in the summertime, and he had uh, cutoffs at his knee, and he had one of those hats with like a cowboy hat, only the part of it's folded up on one side. And he, he came in and we were up on the second floor, and he says, I say, Mites, he says, is it usual for someone to exit this facility by the second story window? And the sheriff's deputy went, oh my God, you know, and ran out. Uh, but Bundy was gone for about three days and he broke into a cabin uh, on that road going up to Independence Pass and there was a liquor cabinet there. And so rather than escape, he got drunk and uh, took a car out of the garage and was arrested back in Aspen for drunk driving. And that, <laughs> but that was my, Great love was the First Amendment and handling that stuff. I really enjoyed that a lot. And, and so your First Amendment practice at Home Roberts was uh, essentially 1970 to 1977? 1970 to 77. And uh, then the other thing I did was I handled uh, a couple of criminal cases, criminal defense work. One of them was a, a, a guy named Tony Mulligan who was a labor organizer who uh, was charged with arson for burning down a number of apartment houses under construction. And uh, I had some, I wouldn't say ill feeling, but negative feeling with some of the lawyers in the firm for handling a, a, a case that got a lot of publicity about a criminal. And uh, they, some of them didn't like it, but the people I worked with thought it was great. So. But that sort of takes us in the late 1970s to when you applied for and became a United States District Judge. Right. Uh, there's a 
there's a person who spans your public defender history and your civil practice and uh, and to this day is an important person and friend in your life. His name is James Bresnahan and uh, his story and your story uh, in helping him uh, and befriending him uh, is extraordinary and I'd, I'd like to talk about him now if that's all right. Sure. Uh, by the way, I, I did talk to him and told him that this might come up and he said by all means for the purpose for which it's done, he's fine. Uh, he has in the past turned down uh, uh, opportunities for uh, movie screenplays and for uh, a book to be written about him that he would not have anything to do with. But for this he said this was fine. So. James Bresnahan's legal story starts in 1964. Uh, can you it actually, it actually starts earlier than that. <laughs> Probably but, starts when he was born. Yeah, almost. When tell, he was about us, nine. tell us uh, when he was born. And, that's right. And well, in, in a narrative form, who, who James Bresnahan was, okay. and who he is today. Uh, James Bresnahan is uh, a man who, when he was a boy at age fifteen, uh, killed his mother and father, and he was convicted on pleas of guilty being represented by a lawyer hired by his maternal grandfather and he was sent to state prison at, at age 15. Uh, I'll get back to some of the details in a moment but I was public defender and I wasn't allowed to handle any other uh, criminal cases but uh, what happened is that uh, his father was a physician and his father had uh, quite a bit of life insurance. He had listed his wife as the beneficiary, the principal beneficiary, and as uh, uh, secondary beneficiaries, his children, uh, Jim, Jim being the oldest, and then a brother and a sister who were toddlers. Uh, the Prudential Insurance Company had this money and they looked at the proceedings that had caused uh, Jimmy to go to the state prison and felt that uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't an airtight case and that if they were to uh, under under the law uh, the if somebody kills an insured they cannot recover the proceeds so if he were guilty of murder, he would not receive this, this money. But if the conviction were set aside, uh, he, he would have a legitimate claim to it. So the Prudential Insurance Company did what insurance companies frequently do in situations like that. They filed what's called an interpleader action. And they take the proceeds of the insurance, they deposit it in the court, and they advise the court that the following facts are uh, this father, the, the doctor died, was murdered, the mother was murdered, uh, the oldest son at age 15 was convicted, and there are uh, other two other siblings, a, a son and a daughter who are one and two, very, very tiny. Uh, we don't know if, if the conviction set aside, we would end up having to pay twice, so we want the court to decide who gets the money. That's what an interpleader action is. Well, the judge uh, in this court, Hatfield Chilson, appointed uh, a lawyer by the name of Ted Woods, uh, Wood, uh, uh, Ted Wood, who uh, was the recently retired senior partner of an insurance law firm, Woodris and Haynes, and uh, he knew him quite well, and uh, Judge Chilson did, and he said, "I have a matter I'd like you to take up as an officer of the court," and he said, "There's no fee in it. There's." So an interpleader action, but I'd like you to uh, uh, be the guardian for this boy who's in prison and file a report. And he says it will take you uh, uh, undoubtedly a trip to Breckenridge where the court records are and to Canyon City to interview him and then come back and file a report. And so uh, uh, Ted Wood said he would do it. And the first thing he did was go to Breckenridge and the judge uh, state judge wouldn't allow him to see the file. And, Why not? Uh, 
because he said he didn't care what the federal court wanted. It was not, uh, he, did, he wasn't an attorney in the case and he couldn't see it. Uh, that judge didn't like lawyers from Denver under any circumstance, but at any rate, he went down to Canyon City to see the boy and he wouldn't talk to him. So This is Jimmy Bresnahan. This is Jimmy Bresnahan. So he came back to uh, Denver and he reported to Judge Chilson that he, he couldn't do anything about this uh, because the judge wouldn't let him and uh, see the records and uh, the boy wouldn't talk to him. Well, <clears throat> at the same time that he was talking to Jimmy in jail, there was another prisoner there who I had represented as public defender, uh, a guy by the name of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a guy by the name of George Robert Gorski. And uh, Gorski was a, a, a great character. I can tell you more about him later, but uh, uh, Gorski, I had been successful in getting his sentence cut from 16 years down to eight. So he thought that I was a miracle worker. And uh, so he tells Jimmy, he says, well, you need to call John Cain. And he says, write him a postcard. And Jimmy says, I don't want to talk to anybody. He says, this guy can help you. And he says, I'll even pay the dime for the stamp, for the postcard. So Ted Woods comes back down again to Canyon City to see Jimmy and uh, Jimmy says, the only person I'll talk to is John Kane. So Ted came back and he uh, asked around if anybody knew who I was, et cetera. And some people knew about me being the public defender. And so he called and asked me to come down to the Denver club where I'd never been uh, for lunch. And I, I did. And he asked me if I would come in on the case. And I said, well, I can't. Uh, I'm public defender. I'm not allowed to have any criminal cases. Well, can you, can you try? He said, I want you to represent me as the guardian. And uh, so, you know, arguably it's not a criminal case. It's a, a habeas corpus, which technically is a civil case. So I said, well, I, I, I'll need to talk to the county commissioners. And I went back to Brighton and I asked for a meeting with them and I did. And I told them what the situation was. And I was very surprised. Mm -hmm. They thought it was the greatest thing in the world. They were flattered that the Adams County was looking so good that a federal judge would want somebody from Adams County working on this case. So they said, by all means, do. And uh, so I agreed to uh, represent Ted Wood. And we went down to Canyon City and I talked with uh, Jimmy. And we started in an investigation, and as I say, Judge Luby wouldn't allow us to see anything. We finally were allowed to see the court files, and then uh, we asked to see the probation report, and he wouldn't let us, so I initiated a uh, mandamus proceeding in the Colorado Supreme Court and got an order that we could see it, and we did that. And uh, then we went uh, and filed a motion and it was very difficult to do. Uh, the judge was very angry and Ted was trying to argue it as the older person there. And uh, Judge Luby at one point threatened him with uh, sanctions. And uh, he said, you're inter interfering with justice. And he kept saying, I'm not, I'm doing what Judge Chilson wants. Well, this isn't a federal court, you know. He got a lot of that kind of parochialism. But uh, at any rate, uh, we, we had to go back up to uh, the Supreme Court again and get another mandamus. And then uh, we, we, set, we tried to get a hearing and he kept denying us a hearing. And he would do things like uh, say, well, you didn't file a notice to set. We'd have to be in Denver, mail a notice to set to Breckenridge and then drive up at which point the clerk would then give us a hearing and then we'd go before the judge on another date. It was just this effort to make everything as difficult as, as possible. Now, during this time, the, the district attorney up there, a man named Gene Lorick, was concerned enough that a 15-year-old boy is charged with murdering his parents that he, uh, he called the Colorado Psychiatric Hospital and they sent two residents up 
to Breckenridge or to Leadville where the jail was where he was being held. And, uh, and they interviewed uh, Jimmy while he, before he had pled guilty. He, uh, the, the two residents filed a report and they said that they felt that uh, an insanity plea was viable because uh, of the battered child syndrome. And that sent the uh, tenured faculty in charge of forensic psychiatry into orbit. The, the director of psychiatry there, John McDonald, was uh, uh, incensed that they would say this. Uh, and and the, the reason is this. The examination was based on, on Jimmy being a battered child, which I'll go into in a moment. But the battered child syndrome was not at that point an accepted part of medical science. C. Henry King, uh, C. Henry Kemp, Kemp uh, had started the instruction and research on the battered child syndrome, and he had uh, 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 cooperated with a, uh, a psychoanalyst uh, at, at the faculty. Uh, and they had formulated the battered child syndrome. And basically what had happened is the pediatrician, Dr. Kemp had looked at all these x-rays of injured children and he would see old, line, old fracture lines. And that indicated how can you have that many fractures? And so he, he continued his investigation and found that these children were battered. And then he got the psychoanalyst, uh, Brant Steele was his name, to look at the, the psychoanalytic aspects of the battered child syndrome, and the two of them came out and formulated this. But it was being circulated at uh, various medical uh, conventions and so forth, and being published, the peer review literature, it had not yet been accepted as, an, uh, as a valid doctrine in uh, medicine. So the Department of Psychiatry at CU was very, uh, noticeably uh, in disagreement over Freud. There was the, the psychoanalytic psychiatrists and then there were the old classification type that did not believe in the Freudian approach. And the two of them fought all the time. Well, the director of forensic psychiatry, Dr. McDonald, was of the old school who rejected Freud. Brant Steele was of the Freudian school, in fact, had known Freud. Uh, and so they fought all the time. Well, what McDonald did was call in these two residents and say, if you insist on pursuing this, he says, he said, the Department of Psychiatry will disavow it and I will recommend that your residencies be terminated. So we had evidence that we couldn't use. Evidence that in effect had been withdrawn and that it was not part of an acceptable, recognized medical doctrine to, to say, look, he was insane, he pled guilty, the insanity pleas have to, or the uh, guilty pleas have to be set aside and he has to be rearranged and we can enter the insanity plea, etc. That was our strategy. So we reported back to Judge Chilson and uh, it was very interesting that uh, Ted Wood said, uh, well, he said, this is not insurance law. He said, and John's doing the job. I don't really need to be there anymore. And Chilson said, oh no, I want you there. I want you, and I says, I want John to continue to be representing you as the guardian of Lydum. So until uh, the day he died, Ted was working on that case uh, with me. Now, at, at about this time, I, uh, uh, I, I was heading toward the, my, toward the Peace Corps. And so we didn't have a hearing yet in the Bresnahan case. And Don McDonald, who I mentioned earlier, was at CU, and he had gone into practice in Denver. And uh, so I asked him to come in on the case, and he did. And then McDonald and I worked together, and then when I went to the Peace Corps, uh, McDonald went to Ted Wood and he said, uh, I need help, and uh, another lawyer, Dale Tooley, uh, 
is going to run for district attorney, but he doesn't have any criminal law background, and he wants some, and he wants to come in on this case. And Ted Wood said, fine. So for the two years that I was gone, they were dealing with this case, and they had to make another trip to the Supreme Court. I can't recall what that one was about. But uh, eventually they had the trial, and I came back. And uh, when I came back from my Peace Corps tour, uh, I contacted McDonald and Ted Wood, and they said, well, we had a hearing, but uh, Judge Louis has never, never reached a verdict. And so there this was is a hearing on whether or not uh, it was a full the trial. Plea, the guilty plea was, should be withdrawn and right. he should be allowed to plead insanity. Right. And he had never ruled. The, the basis of it was that he was denied competent counsel because counsel should have seen to it that a 15 year old with a battered child syndrome could plead not guilty by reason of insanity. And so this lawyer who was from Cheyenne along with uh, Jimmy's maternal father in law had been hired by him, had come down. And uh, my recollection is that uh, this lawyer told Jimmy that if he wanted to, uh, there was a possibility of his entering insanity pleas, but if he did, he would spend the rest of his life in an insane asylum, and plus the fact that even if he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, his, his grandparents would have to sell their house and lose all their money in order to pay for it. And so Jimmy said I, he didn't want any of that. And so he pled guilty. So there was some question of the methods used to extract a plea from him. Uh, at any rate, they had the hearing, Judge Luby never decided. So I said, well, mandamus again, we go up because there's a Colorado statute says that if a judge has held a case under advisement for, I can't remember the time, but X number of months and doesn't decide it, you, you can, upon complaint, have his pay withheld. It's 12 months. Is it 12 months? Okay. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I said, let's file that. So I prepared the, the uh, mandamus proceedings and I went to, uh, the, it was in the state capitol building. This was before the judicial building was built. But I went over there and I was uh, walking in and the state capitol had a coffee shop in the, in the ground floor as you walked in uh, without going up the big steps, sort of a basement, they had a, a coffee shop and uh, Ed, Chief Justice Pringle was there. So he said, oh, when did you get back? And I told him, you know, a couple of months or something. And, and what are you doing now? And I told him, and I said, what do you got there? And I said, oh, I said, it's another Bresnahan mandamus petition. And he looks at me and he says, let me see it. And I handed it to him. And he said, you know, he said, we don't need all this bad publicity. He said, let me call Luby. He said, can you withhold filing it for a week or so? And uh, he says, I'll call him and tell him that he has to decide the case. So I said, sure. So I left and Judge Pringle contacted Judge Luby, and then uh, I think it was Pringle's assistant, Harry Lawson, who called me and said, the chief has talked to Luby and he gave him 30 days to come out with his decision, or he would impose the salary thing. So on the 29th day, Luby resigned, retired from office. And never wrote it? Never wrote it. So uh, they took the file, transcripts and everything, and they gave it to uh, another judge. And the other judge was Dan Shannon, who was a, a good judge. He was in Jefferson County. But uh, all he had was the record, and Luby wouldn't allow any information to come in. So the record was, was, was one that wasn't probative of the issues. And uh, he said, I have to deny it on the basis of this record. But he said, I, I'm going to include my opinion that I think that you should appeal this because uh, the record is inadequate. So we said, okay. And so we filed a notice of appeal and uh, it went to the Colorado Supreme Court one more time and they uh, denied relief. And so we came over here to federal court. And this all had taken uh, 10 years. So Jimmy was now no longer a 15 year old kid, he was 25. 
and I'll tell you about his background and what he did later. But at any rate, we appeared in front of Judge Fred Winter, and uh, Winter was fascinated with the case, and he said, well, he said, it still isn't the law that uh, the, the battered child syndrome is a recognized, uh, accepted within the medical community. We said, that's right, uh, it isn't, but it's not rejected either. It's being deliberated at this stage. And he says, well, you're gonna have to take that to the Court of Appeals. So he denied it. And so I turned to Jimmy, who was president of the court, and I said, looks like we're going up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, he said, wait a minute. He said, can I talk to you? And I said, yes. And, and uh, uh, poor old Ted Wood was there. And he said, I just want to talk to you alone. And I said, okay. And so Ted left and two guys from the Colorado Attorney General's office left. And I was just at the council table with him. And uh, I think the guard was over at the corner watching. But he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, I've been in there for 10 years. He said, I have taken every single course that's available to me while a prisoner. He said, I have worked in the lab doing hematology. And he said, I've received an A in every course I've taken. And he said, I can't do anything more. But he says, can you get me a commutation? And he looked at me and he said, you know, even if you win this, he said, all it means is that the money that's on deposit with the court would go to, to me, and st or a third of it would go to me instead of to my brother and sister. And he says, I wouldn't accept it anyway. It should all go to them. And I'm over 21 and I'm willing to sign whatever it is to let them have it. So he said, but can you get me a commutation? And I said, well, I, I can't guarantee it, but I could try. So rather than appeal, we, I, I was at Home Roberts by this time, and rather than appeal, uh, I prepared a, uh, a petition for the governor uh, to uh, commute his sentence. And John Vanderhoof was a Republican, was the uh, governor, and he had been defeated by uh, Dick Lamb. And I worked and worked to get this in front of Vanderhoof, and it was his last day in office. This is 19, 1975 now. I finally got an appointment <clears throat> with him and I went in and he looks at it and he, I knew him because my dad had served with him in the legislature uh, and I had also contacted my partner Ted Stockmar who was a, a, a notab notable Republican who knew Vanderhoof quite well and had Vanderhoof or had uh, Stockmar make the appointment for me. So he looks at it and he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he picks up the paper and he reads it like this. And he says, I am not going to have my last official act being uh, one where I free some murderer. He said, we'll just leave that on the desk and let little Dicky Lamb take care of it when he gets sworn in tomorrow. So that's what he did. Well, I knew, uh, I knew Lamb, we'd taken the bar at the same time, and I, I knew him as a lawyer and uh, so on, so I said, okay. I filed it again, and this time uh, Lamb was getting organized uh, in his office, and he had a, a person helping him who I would refer to, I don't know if this is true or not, but I would call a dollar a year man. It was a, a guy that was helping him out and so on was Jeremy Seamus. And I don't think Seamus was on the payroll because Seamus didn't need to be, but at any rate, he was helping out. And so Lamb had given this Bresnahan issue to him and he came to see me and he said, uh, I've got to look at the file and everything. And I said, I've got it all and, and so on. And uh, so then he said, uh, Governor Lamb says that he recalls Dale Tooley had something to do with this. And by this time, Tooley was district attorney. So I said, yeah, he did. And I said, if, you, uh, if you're gonna see him, I said, tell him I've got all the files and whatever he needs, I'll be happy to uh, give to him. So uh, he said, okay. And then he, uh, a couple of days later, he called and he said, well, I've seen Tooley. And he says, I have some bad news for you. And uh, I said, what are you talking about? said he hasn't called, he hasn't asked for anything. 
And so I met with Seamus and Seamus says, well, he said, Thule says that it's not a good idea for Lamb being a brand new governor. It's politically unwise to take on a controversy like this at the beginning of his uh, administration. And he should at least wait a while before he decides it. And uh, I said, okay. I said, that's what Thule told you? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I said, will you deliver a message to Lamb for me? And he said, sure. I said, you tell him that Jimmy Bresnahan has spent 12 years, I think it was, in, in prison uh, under uh, very unjust circumstances. And I've spent the last 12 years trying to get him out, and I will spend the next 12 years if necessary. But I will spend the next 50 years, if it takes it, to see that Dale Tooley is disbarred. He was this man's lawyer, and he has just said that to you. And I said, that's grounds in my view for disbarment. So, as uh, Seamus told me later, he kind of laughed about it. And he said, uh, well, okay. And he went in to see Lamb and told him what Tooley had said. And he says, oh, by the way, he said, uh, he said, Kane was really angry. And he said, this is what he said. He said, I, I don't place much stock in it. And Lamb said, you don't know him, I do. <laughs> he said, uh, you tell John that I will grant the commutation on one condition. This is the end of it, no more. And so Seamus told me, and I said, I've got a client, that's the end of it, okay. So that was the end, he signed the commutation. Jimmy went to, uh, was transferred over to Pueblo. So was he commuted to a term, sir? He was commuted to a, a term of 10 years to life, which made him automatically eligible for uh, release from the 10 year, but he'd served 12 already but he got the second degree commutation. So he could go up to life, but he was still serving a sentence. But they transferred him because he'd already done the minimum. He was eligible to be a trustee by their uh, regulations. And he went over to Pueblo where he worked in the lab doing blood tests. And somehow he got some old bicycle parts and put them together and he enrolled at uh, uh, what was then called the University of Southern Colorado, and uh, uh, now it's what, Colorado State University at Pueblo or something. But he went there, and again, he got straight A's, and he took every course he could that would fit into his schedule. So he even had courses like one was introduction to children's literature in the education department, because that's all he could fit in on that schedule. He took all these other courses, and uh, then he got, uh, uh, I was appointed to the bench. No, I'm sorry, no, he, he was commuted, and uh, he came up to uh, Denver, and he, he lived with me and with my wife and uh, children. Uh, the two older ones were uh, living there at the time. So he was paroled after his commutation? He was paroled after the commutation, and he was in Denver, and during all of his education in the state prison and in the, while he was at the state hospital, he was unable to take a course in physics or another one in calculus. So he, he enrolled at Regis University and he went over there. I, we live in East Denver, but he went over there every day and, and he took uh, calculus and uh, physics. And uh, I had at the time, client, uh, at, I was at Home Roberts, and I was representing a very famous and wonderful uh, transplant surgeon by the name of Thomas Starzl, who had, uh, at that time, was the leading world surgeon on kidney transplants, and later started doing total heart and lung transplants, but at that point he was uh, doing kidney transplants. So I called uh, Dr. Starzl on the phone and I said uh, I've got this guy and he works in a lab and he knows blood tests and all that and I said do you have a place for him and he said sure and he used a term I'd never heard before he says oh he says we need we always need a deaner and deaner is a word used in a lab for the guy that moves the test tubes around and cleans things up sort of I always thought it was like Igor in the Frankenstein <laughs> movie but at any rate he got that job, and I told uh, 
uh, Dr. Starzl that Brant Steele and Henry Kemp knew all about Jim. So he sees Brant Steele and Steele says, well, if he wants to, I'll be happy to, to treat him and give him some uh, therapy while he's trying to readjust. And so he saw Steele and he worked for Starzl and uh, see Henry Kemp and there was another doctor out there, I think his name was Archer or Arthur, something like that. But Jimmy applied for med school and they got him in. And he went to uh, med school and he- uh, CU Med School? CU Med School at Denver. And he, uh, he financed that by uh, signing up with the US Public Health Service. And like the military, they will pay for somebody to go to med school and for every year of med school, they spend a year in service. And so the public health service does that as well. And he did that. And then when he, uh, when he graduated, uh, he did a combined internship fellowship in internal medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Denver. And then he went to work for the public health service uh, to uh, try to, abbreviate this is so difficult, but at any rate, when he was in the prison, uh, it was the uh, Spanish speaking, the Hispanics in the prison who protected him as a 15 year old boy so that he wouldn't be raped and uh, molested by the, uh, the other inmates and they protected him. And so he learned to speak Spanish and he swore that if he ever got out, he was going to devote his life to helping these people because they had saved his life. So he went to the public health service and essentially volunteered, went to the uh, uh, San Joaquin County Hospital in the San Joaquin Valley, and he spent his career uh, treating migrant farm workers. And while doing so, he, uh, realized that their principal medical problem was uh, gastrointestinal, uh, a lot from alcohol and the kind of diet they had, but they were getting ulcers and stomach cancers and other gastrointestinal problems. So he applied for a fellowship at Long Island Hospital in Brooklyn in gastroenterology, and they admitted him for this program but New York would not give him uh, uh, permission, a, a medical license, because he had a felony conviction. So I was on the bench. I couldn't do anything about that. And I called my friend Mike Kanjus, who was very familiar with all this. We're in probably 1979 now. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And so uh, Kanjus went to, then it was Governor Roy Romer, and he got a pardon for him. And uh, Governor Romer uh, made some marvelous statements about, you know, this. at 15 he's a murderer sentenced for life and now at his age he's a uh, highly respected specialist in medicine and wants to go further and become further specialized and, and he deserves it. So he said he's an example for all of us and uh, he granted the pardon and uh, Jimmy went to uh, Long Island and he uh, got his whatever postdoctoral certification in gastroenterology and then he went back to the San Joaquin County Hospital and practiced there until he retired. And uh, he retired just a couple of years ago and he now is living uh, part of the year in uh, uh, in Fresno and part of the year in Denver. And you and your wife and he and his wife are friends to this day. Oh, very, very much so, yeah. Um, when you were sworn in as a uh, federal judge in, I think, 19, late 1977. Yes. Um, he was living in your house, as I recall. Yes, he was. Uh, and did that become a, a subject of some press yeah, there notoriety was a, at the time? There was a New York uh, Times reporter by the name of Molly Ivins who was from Texas. She's the one who, uh, uh, with uh, George W. Bush, uh, uh, called him shrub, and was the one that coined that phrase for him. So she, Molly Ivins was, I guess, very well known. She's passed away as well. 
But uh, she wrote an article that was in the New York Times that said something about President Jimmy Carter is appointed a judge and no other judge can make this statement that has a convicted first degree murderer living in his house. And it, she wrote this story. There was a, quite a bit of publicity about it. Uh, I mean, his story is profound and your experience with him is profound. Um, we'll talk about sentencing practices more when we get into yeah. your 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 uh, judicial career, but I, I wonder whether uh, you have any observations about how that experience uh, sort of shaped your sentencing philosophy. Well, yeah, and it, it shaped a lot of things with me. Uh, first of all, it, uh, that case was badly handled from the very beginning, and uh, the the law at that time has changed. With An expert could now come into court, whether it's accepted or not, by the scientific community and say, I've done the research and this is what I say. And it could be brought forward. But in those days, it couldn't. It had to be, in order to be admissible, it had to be considered to be orthodox doctrine. So th that was bad uh, at the time. And the other thing is that there, one of the things that I paid attention to is, and I think I got a lot of this from my conversations with uh, Dr. Brant Steele, the psychoanalyst, but when people are dealing with what is objectively referred to as parenticide, that they have a, almost everyone has a deep-seated fear of this. It's related to the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex, and parenticide uh, uh, is one of these unspoken, deeply subconscious fears that people have. And they hear of a child killing a parent and there's just horror attached to it. Well, if you pursue it and you understand why all of that is, the effect on my sentencing approach is it's consistent with my thought that you can't simply look at a statute and look at a report and put your thumb on it and say that's the sentence. You have to look at a sentence from every possible perspective and that includes the victims and the fears that they might have or what the victims may have done that unintentionally has or intentionally has, has helped to create this terrible situation. You have to look at the defendant and uh, the uh, friends, the education, uh, the, uh, the health, physical and mental of all of these people. And you have to look at society at large and see what's going on with the publicity that surrounds these things. The Bresnan case was highly, highly publicized and that did not help him. People would read it and say, oh, you know, why aren't they executing him? Oh, you can't execute anybody under the age of 18. Well, then he should spend the rest of his life in prison. End of story. And it wasn't. It wasn't end of story. And we didn't know so much about it. I learned a tremendous amount about the battered child syndrome and about the struggle that scientists had at that time, and I think still do to some extent, to get their findings and their, their theories that are that are advancing knowledge and to get those things accepted. And it's very, very difficult. People are entrenched with no, notions and, and parenticide is one of them. And it affects judges just as much as it does anybody else. So when you talk about it, uh, there's an immediate response of, uh, even if it isn't a vis uh, an identifiable response, there's a subconscious reaction to the idea of parenticide. And so th th that, that had a, a big effect on me. The other effect is that, you know, it's a shame that one person with his intelligence and his drive uh, and dedication was able to overcome tremendous brutality. He suffered as a psychological battering and physical battering as a child to be driven to that point and then to come out of it and to dedicate his life, rehabilitation is, is always a, a possibility. 
But the other thing you have to look at as a judge is to look and see the abject failure of our punitive prison system. Because what was he doing there in the first place? He shouldn't have been there, as, ever. As a 15 year old? As a 15 year old, he should never have been there. He should have been taken over to the state hospital. He should have received the therapy he needs in the one or two years and been out. And I know that for a fact because I had another case with a 15-year-old boy that murdered a nine-year-old girl. And only this time he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And he went to Pueblo and uh, that, that had something to do with my appointment as a judge too because that particular case, it was called uh, the, the little girl that was uh, killed was Paula Sue Steinbeck. And uh, it became the Colorado Press Association story of the year. So it was just, you know, inundated with news everywhere. Uh, but we were able to get him, and that's when I was public defender, and we got him down to uh, Pueblo, and he spent about a year there, and uh, most of the time lived in the house of the superintendent of the hospital, and received some therapy, and got out, and went back home, and was able to build a life again. And so I, that kind of thing I think is what we need to look at is what, uh, you know, I, I, I'll say one other thing and then I'll answer your question, but the, the idea, you hear all the time people saying, I want justice for somebody. They, I want justice for, you know, whoever was killed. And they say, I want a prosecutor, I want justice for her. That's not justice, that's vengeance. Justice is balancing. That's what justice means, is to balance, to restore. And people are talking about they want justice all the time when they really mean they want revenge. They, they want a, a legitimate way of expressing their nastiness. Uh, let me do a, a, a time progression. Okay. Because uh, your, your experience with James Bresnahan spans 1964 to the present, 2019. Uh, in 1977, uh, there was a vacancy on the, on the district bench for the United States District Court for the District of Colorado when Judge Araj, I think, took senior status. That's correct. Uh, and uh, you applied for that. Yes. Uh, why were you interested in being a judge at that point? Well, I, uh, a lot of things. I go back to being a kid and seeing Judge Walsh for one thing. Uh, it goes to the psychology professor in high school who said, I think you would be good at this sort of thing. Uh, then when I got out of law school, I, for the, I took the bar, but there was a six month period from December until April uh, when I worked as a, a law clerk for the two Adams County judges. And I, it was a brand new district and I put together the library, the law library for them because there wasn't one before. It was part of the old first judicial district. So this is a brand new one, and that's what I did until I was admitted. So I knew those judges, uh, and, I, and, I, and they were very good to me. So, and then Judge Kingsley, I knew as a practicing lawyer, and then he became a judge. And so I had a, a very, uh, very high opinion of him. I, I also, uh, I think I was more interested in, I liked representing people. I didn't particularly like representing corporations. There was too much of a, a dollar sign attached to everything. And how many billable hours can you do this? And what needs to be done here? And that sort of thing. And I'm not talking about it being unethical. I don't mean that, it's just that I, I didn't like to have to keep track of all that. I wanted to, to spend more time thinking, what can we do to reach a just decision? And that's not necessarily what a lawyer is supposed to do. So I think while I enjoyed practicing law, and I particularly enjoyed the theater involved in trial law, uh, I, I just had this gnawing sense that I ought to be doing something else, uh, something more. Uh, I did not think I was going to get appointed when I applied. Uh, uh, so we're, we're in 1977, uh, yeah. and Jimmy Carter's 
been president for about a year. Um, you have to go back before that. Uh, <laughs> before he was president, Gerald Ford was. And Gerald Ford, there was uh, Judge Raj had uh, taken senior status in order to have his vacancy filled by President Ford, a Republican. And President Ford had nominated uh, a lawyer who had been a congressman named Don Brotsman, and he'd been, a, I think, the uh, U.S. attorney here, and he'd been a s lieutenant governor of Colorado. But Don Brotsman uh, had, uh, if not an enemy, uh, somebody that didn't like him, was the senior senator from Colorado. Uh, and uh, That was Floyd Haskell? That was Floyd Haskell. And so the Senate has this thing called a blue slip, where I don't know if they still use it or not, mm -hmm. but uh, they send out a, a, a slip of paper with the judge's name on it and say you sign off that you're okay with us going ahead with this. And if you don't send it back, that's called blue slipping. And they never can, the Senate doesn't process the nomination. So that's what happened to Brotsman, is that Senator Haskell blue slipped him, and then Ford lost in the election and uh, Hart, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Carter was elected president and Gary Hart was the junior senator. Now, I, I'm not privy to these conversations, so I don't know exactly what happened, but I know that Haskell had somebody else in mind, and the newspapers had uh, said that this other person was the one that uh, Haskell wanted. And I applied because I thought, this is a, well, it was announced that it was going to be a merit selection system. And that was new in Colorado, and that was nationwide. It was nationwide it was new. And <laughs> when Jimmy Carter had been governor, I did not know Jimmy Carter, by the way. I had met Lillian Carter once, uh, casually, when she was a Peace Corps volunteer in India, and I was on the staff. Uh, but that was a, hello, this is our oldest volunteer, how do you do, nice to meet you. You know, I didn't really know her that well, but I'd met her, but I'd never met Carter. Uh, but when Carter was governor of, of, of Georgia, they had a terribly corrupt system, and he cleaned it up as governor. And the way he did was to set up a merit selection commission. And the judges that were appointed by the governor had to go through this merit selection process. So when Carter was elected president, he took that same system and the custom, at least then, was that the senator, first senior and then junior, but the senator of the same political party as the president, got the choice of who became a district judge and the quid pro quo was that the circuit judges were appointed by the president and the senators would support his choice. So what my understanding is that uh, when Carter became president, he set up the similar merit selection system that he'd had in Georgia for the circuit courts. And the press was enthusiastic about it. The American Judicature Society just just were ebullient over this uh, uh, merit selection system that he was using. Now, I don't know this for a fact. My understanding is that the Senator Haskell wanted to get away from the uh, bad feeling and the animosity of the Republicans in Colorado because he had blue-slipped uh, Brotsman. So he set up a merit selection commission and Senator Hart, uh, it may have been his idea, I don't know, but it was at any rate, Senator Hart chose so many people for the merit selection commission, Senator Haskell chose so many, and then uh, Dan Hoffman, who at that time was the uh, president of the Colorado Bar Association, selected the other five, and I believe that uh, of the 15, there was some sort of a rule that only seven or eight could be lawyers. The others had to be, there had to be non-lawyer representation on the committee. Well, 
among others, they, they selected Maury Ballantyne. And uh, Maury Ballantyne was, uh, she, she was really good to me, and, and we were very friendly. I knew her very well. The, she was the publisher of the Durango Herald. The publisher Herald. of the Durango Herald. And uh, uh, a, a roommate of mine in college was working for the Durango Herald, and so we, we stayed current on these things. We were, but we were good friends. And uh, the, the other was that, I think it was Eddie Pringle who was responsible for this, but they chose a non-lawyer, a PhD in chemistry named Chester Alter to be the chairman of the commission. And Chester, at Eddie Chief Justice Pringle's urging earlier, had joined and become active in the American Judicature Society and had just finished stepping down as president of the American Judicature Society and he had helped to implement the merit selection panel for, for Carter and spreading the word around the country to have these merit selection panels. So he was the chairman and he was gung-ho and he had all of the data from the American Judicature Society as to how to conduct the meetings and the uh, application forms, etc. Now my understanding is this, and it, again, it's, I, I don't have any verification for this. I'm told that, well, first of all, I know that the form that was used on the application was prepared by Chester Alter from the forms he got from the American Judicature Society. And these were 15 to 20 page forms that you had to fill out. And it had not just your name and education and the usual sort of thing, but it had uh, one of the things that it had in it was uh, uh, list the five most important cases that you've tried and who were the attorneys on those cases. So this is what I understand happened. This other man who was Senator Haskell's selection had to go through the merit selection process and then according to the Denver Post, the fix was in and he would get the appointment. But a police officer in, in a mountain community saw this and he went to Chester Alter, and Chester Alter was the, uh, he, he was the epitome of propriety. He says, I can't talk to you about it. This is sui, you know, juris, I can't do it. The guy just hands him this envelope and says, just read this. And what it was, was this applicant had been arrested and he had, he had been arrested and the file was missing and the police officer who arrested him thought that that might happen, so he had Xerox copies of this, and that's what he gave to Alter. So when we, there were like 85 people who applied, and the list was cut down to 15, and then on a Sunday, uh, the interviews took place, and it was a, a room at uh, the, what was then the University of Denver Law School, and it was a big horseshoe table where the members of the commission sat and then one chair in the middle, the, the hot spot. And so when I went in, I, Chester Alter says, now you made this application and it was under oath, right? And I said, yes. And uh, he said, uh, and everything you said in there is true. And I looked and I couldn't figure out what was he talking about. And so then I said, well, I said, you listed, you asked for the five most important cases that I've tried and the names of those lawyers. And since I filled that out, I've tried and had another case, which is far more important than those. So I should probably disclose that. And he said, no, that's all right. That's all right. That doesn't matter. Okay. It was, it was correct when you put it down, right? And I said, well, yeah. And I remember Don McDonald was one of the members of the uh, committee. And he turned to me when I looked so puzzled about why is he asking about this. And he says, he's asking all the applicants that, John. Don't worry about it. So I left and I went home. And I had no idea. I, I didn't think I was going to get it, but I, my thought was, if I apply now, then I can apply later. 
I can apply for a state judgeship, I can apply for a federal judgeship, but this is getting my hat into the ring. That's what my thought was at the time. So uh, apparently this other lawyer came in and, and uh, Chancellor Alder asked him the same question, is there anything you want to change? And uh, what I'm told, you were there, I wasn't, but I'm told, he said, uh, oh, no, I don't have anything to change. You, sir, are a liar. You, sir, are a perjurer. You, sir, are not worthy of applying. That You said under oath and you were arrested. And he said something like, but that was expunged. And, but he was finished. So there they were. They had to select uh, three names to go to the White House. And, uh, and mine was one. And two other uh, people were, I think, very, very highly qualified. Uh, one was Jim Carrigan, who had been my professor. One and, was Dan uh, Shannon, who had uh, adjudicated the Bresnahan case. Yeah, uh, no, no, Wasn't no, it no, it was Bill Neighbors. You're right. Bill Neighbors was the other one. And so, and Bill had been on the Colorado Supreme Court. In fact, he still might have been there at the time, but he was a first-rate guy. and in an office, and here I was, a lawyer, I didn't know that I, I didn't think I had much of a chance, but I had been very active with the National Defender Project, and I'd been active with the litigation section of the ABA, and I'd written a number of articles. I, I can't begin to tell you how many articles I've written, but in excess of 40, and probably a dozen of them are in the, the ABA litigation section journal. So I knew the I knew the publisher, the editor-in-chief, uh, and the, the, the publisher of that magazine. Well, the names, I, I got a call from Chester Alter and said, you're one of three names and this is totally confidential. We don't want you to tell anybody. And I said, fine, I didn't. Uh, Kerrigan did. And Kerrigan had an interview in the Rocky Mountain News and said that he thought he was very anxious or very eager to compete because Bill Neighbors and John Kane were both students of his and they were excellent students. So, you know, he gave a, a kind of a self-inflating uh, graciousness to, uh, to us. Well, it, the three names went to the White House and I had uh, a friend of mine, this editor for Litigation Magazine, who was a partner at Williams and Connolly. Uh, Edward Bennett Williams and Paul Connolly, a very famous law firm at the time. And uh, this guy had, uh, Charlie Wilson, had been a law clerk to uh, Supreme Court Justice William Douglas before he had gone into this firm. And he specialized in, uh, he, he was also a former newspaper reporter, and he specialized in First Amendment, particularly freedom of the press uh, cases. And so, but I knew him from all these meetings we'd gone to, and I called and I said, Charlie, I said, I, uh, my name's one of three names in the White House, can you do anything to help me? And he said, well, I can't, but Connolly can. And Paul Connolly was the chairman of the litigation section, and so he went into his office, and uh, Connolly, he said, uh, you know this guy, he's the chairman of our long-range planning committee, and he says, he's the kid that writes all those articles. He said, yeah, and he says, uh, okay, he said, uh, I'll see what I can do. And uh, so Kerrigan, who's now gone to his reward, but Kerrigan made a terrible strategic blunder. He tried to solicit the support of the American Trial Lawyers Association. It's, the name has changed now. It's called Trial Lawyers for Justice, I think. But in those days, it was Melvin Belli and the American Trial Lawyers Association. They represented primarily plaintiffs in civil personal injury cases. The Attorney General was Grisham Bell, who was an insurance defense lawyer who literally despised the American Trial Lawyers Association. So Kerrigan got all of those folks to try and lobby for him, and it was the most negative response they could get was from Griffin Bell and his number one guy who he brought with him from his law firm, they didn't want anything to do with putting a, a plaintiff's lawyer on the, uh, on the bench. So what happened is that Connolly took Attorney General Bell out to play golf 
and at the end of the golf game, when they're having a drink, he hands him uh, a, uh, a matchstick from the Burning Tree Club with my name written on it, and said, this guy's with our section, it would really help because we're a new section to get somebody from the ABA litigation section appointed to the bench. And so Bell took it and says, well, I'll check it out. And uh, so he, uh, as the story I hear, he went to uh, his office the next day and his uh, assistant who he brought with him from Sidley and Austin, the law firm they were in, he tosses the matchbook on the cover and he says, uh, they're looking for this guy for a district judgeship in Colorado, check him out. And that's what the guy's job primarily was, was doing the due diligence on judicial nominations. The way he did it was he had gone to Yale College and he would get out his alumni directory, wherever the person was from, he'd look to see who he knew from Yale and he would call that person and say, what about this person? And so he looks at it, and Bruce Rockwell had been a, a Denver banker, had been a classmate of this guy. So he calls Bruce Rockwell, who I didn't really know, but he says, well, I've heard of him and so on. But he said, ask our other classmate, Jay Tracy, who was a lawyer at Holland and Hart. And he says, Tracy knows him, I'm sure. So he calls Jay Tracy. Well, I knew Jay very well. We tried cases, a couple of them together, and I think one opposing, and we were as lawyers should be, good friends. And so he said, oh yeah, yeah, he's terrific. He said, he'd be great. And he said, but I'll tell you, call his partner, Jim Owen. He was another classmate. And Owen gave me the best endorsement that you could receive. He said to this lawyer from the Justice Department, he says, oh, pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. Why would you take him from us? We want him, we're grooming him to be head of our litigation department. So, <laughs> and I mean, it's that kind of negative endorsement that did it, I think. But at any rate, I, uh, I was nominated. And uh, so uh, I, I came over here and uh, began my career. I was, uh, and my commission was dated December the 16th, 1977. And I was sworn in on uh, January the 8th, 1978. Who swore you in? Fred Winter was chief judge. And the uh, court met en banc. And I had uh, Bob Kingsley put the robe on me, and Peter Holm, my other mentor, presented me to the court. Uh, and at that time, how many district judges were there, both senior and active? Well, uh, I have to name them because I can't think of total it otherwise. Uh, Hatfield Chilson was a senior judge. Uh, Al Araj was a senior judge. Uh, Bill Doyle had just been elevated previously to the uh, Court of Appeals. Fred Winter was the chief judge. That's what Sherman Feinsilver and Richard Mach. So that would be seven or eight. Seven, seven or eight, eight. yeah. And we didn't have uh, magistrates in those days, not magistrate judges anymore. When, when, when you were confirmed, uh, what, what kind of mentoring <laughs> was there other than that on the job? Well, it's been my, I, 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 I say this just genuinely, it's been one of the great privileges of my life. Uh, I went back to uh, Washington and Dick Schmidt, who I'd mentioned with, uh, had called me and said, you can stay at my house. Uh, while you're here and uh, for this hearing and I want to be there when you're uh, testifying before the Senate you know a subcommittee and uh, so I flew in and I had to go to the Senate office building and that's the first time I met Gary Hart and he was the junior senator and I never did meet Haskell Haskell never showed up for any of these meetings or votes or anything. He had nothing to do with it. So I just didn't know him. I ne never have to this day. Well, he's dead too. But at any rate, I met Hart. And uh, we went to uh, this committee meeting uh, room, and there were a number of nominees to go through. And one of them was Jim Logan for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, and the other was uh, Monroe McKay, 
and uh, the other was Stephanie Seymour, and then me. And this is all in 1977. This is all night December, yeah, or 1970. I guess it was November, October, but because the commission wouldn't sign until December. But at any rate, they went through and. The big point of controversy, it wasn't controversy, but the, the big item of interest was Monroe McKay because his brother was a congressman, Gunn McKay, Gunner McKay, and the two senators uh, from uh, Utah were both Republicans. And so they weren't going to have a choice or to do anything, but they were also Mormons and they weren't about to blue slip somebody because they happened to be nominated by by Carter you know it wasn't they couldn't do that so they were there and Gunn McKay was there with his brother and I think he was the ranking uh, Democrat from Utah so the Carter administration had listened to him on his circuit these circuit appointments so anyway that was the interest from the press was that McKay was presented and they did that and they they presented Seymour and then they presented uh, Logan and when they finished and I'm sitting there next to Gary Hart and when I when they finished they all get up and leave and Hart looks at me and I look at him and he says uh, he says just a minute and he went out in the hallway he says senator senator he says, we have one more a district judge here and they all looked, and so there was a, a senator from uh, Alabama who was older then than I am now, and he, he said, uh, Senator Allen, he said, oh, I'll take care of it. You, you boys go ahead. So he came back in and sat down, and that morning in the Washington Post newspaper was a story that two federal judges in Louisiana had sued the federal government on the theory that inflation had caused a reduction in their income in violation of Article 3 of the Constitution. So Senator Allen looks at me and he says, with that heavy Alabama accent, and he could have cared less, you know, but he just looked. So he says, uh, Hart made a talk at first presented me and then he said thank you and then he looks at me and he says well young man he said are you if you become a United States district judge are you going to join those two judges down there in New Orleans that are suing their own government for a raise and that was the one question he asked and I said senator I said I'm told I'm not allowed to say what I would do once I become a judge, but I'm a trial lawyer now and I can smell a loser a mile away. And he looked at me and he's, you do all right, boy, and closed it up and walked out. So that was my Senate hearing. And he, he was the only vote for confirmation of the Judiciary it was, Committee? It was unanimous. Yeah, he was the only vote in that subcommittee. And then it went to the Judiciary Committee and then it was, uh, the Senate passed it unanimously. So. In fact, they did all of them that day. You know, there weren't any objections to any of them. So that was a different day, wasn't it? It was a different day. Uh, yeah. Perhaps. Uh, but I be, I, that's where I met Hart. And I, uh, I, I tre we, we have become friends, and I, I treasure my friendship with him. He's one of the most uh, marvelous people I've ever met. You became friends with Judge Arash after you you uh, replaced him as an active judge as well, as I understand it. Yeah, I knew him before, but I was a lawyer appearing in front of him, and he, he, he liked me, I think, you know, as a lawyer. But we became very close uh, after I uh, was appointed. And I think it, uh, I, I think it, or it became that way uh, because as soon as I was appointed, as soon as I had a commission, I, I made an appointment to come see him. And I asked him, I said, uh, I know you don't have to do this, but I would like your advice. And uh, I'd, I'd like some guidance from you as to what I do and how I do it. And uh, I, I'll never forget the first thing he said. Well, he said, the most important thing that a, a trial judge can learn, and you better learn it now, is never pass up an opportunity to pee. 
but he gave some some really good advice later on uh, and it leads to something else we need to talk about uh, but between that December 16 and January the 8th it's Christmas time and lawyers all have not all of them but I mean lawyers have a lot of Christmas parties and they invite other lawyers to go to it plus their clients and so and now, the, now we're between when you receive your commission in 77 and, and, and when you're sworn in. So uh, I had, had previously uh, received invitations to go to different uh, law firm Christmas parties. And uh, one of them was from uh, my friend who was on the committee, Dan Hoffman. Well, he wasn't on the committee. He put five on it. But uh, Dan had a, was in a law firm at the time and they were having a Christmas party and so I went to it. And I didn't think much about it, just went to his party and then the next night there was another party at a firm that does insurance defense work. And I was invited to that firm and I didn't go. And I, I to this day I couldn't tell you why I didn't go. I mean, it just, I'd been one the night before, and whatever it was, I had something else to do, but I just didn't go. The following day, I get calls from lawyers all over the place telling me that this law firm is spreading that I am not a good candidate for the bench because I hang around with plaintiff's lawyers and I'm going to be a plaintiff judge. Because you didn't go to the party? Because I didn't go to the insurance defense firm's party. <laughs> And the fact is, I didn't do personal injury work, other than, well, libel, I guess, but I mean, I never did that kind of work. And uh, so I, I, I represented an insurance company, but not in a personal injury matter. Uh, so I, I just didn't have any, I, I didn't, I didn't what, what's the thing? I, I didn't have any skin in that game. But I just went to one party, and I didn't go to the next, and then all of a sudden this happened. So I was very, very disturbed by it. And I went to see Judge Araj, and uh, I told him what had happened. And he looks at me, and this is the first time he ever said this to me, but he called me son. And he said, and it meant a lot to me that he did. And he just said, son, he said, you're gonna have to learn something and you're gonna have to understand this. You either go to all of those parties or you go to none of them. Because sure as hell, you go to one, you don't go to the other this is what happens so I took that I took that to heart and there, there were very very few times I went to any lawyers party after that very few times uh, and that was what he had told me the other thing I at the time I was appointed uh, and my mentor at the law firm Peter Pete Holm had said, uh, he said, whatever you do when you become a judge, he said, don't be one of those judges that just rules and never tells anybody why. He said, whenever you rule, he said, the, the lawyers and their clients and the public deserve to know what the basis for your ruling is. And uh, I mentioned that to Judge Raj, and he said, he's absolutely right. He said, that's what you have to do. He said, there's nothing worse than some judge that stands up there and thinks that he, he can just uh, act like Caesar and put thumbs up or thumbs down. He said, you have to explain and justify what you're doing. So I, I took those, uh, those lessons to heart and uh, I tried and I think, I, I think I've succeeded in doing that. that. That I haven't had a case that I just said, well, that's the way I rule, you know, tough. Tough agates, fella, that's the way it is. I've never done that. It's a good segue to uh, uh, how prolific you have been as a judicial writer since 1978. Uh, by my count, you've published more than 1,600 uh, written opinions, uh, and the unpublished uh, opinions number over a thousand, um, and uh, many of them make extraordinarily detailed and deal with very complex issues. Uh, do, do, do you have sort of a, a generic uh, writing 
philosophy that that governs the way you approach a case, or or, or you're more eclectic? I think I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I, uh, because there are different modalities of writing. I I like when I have a uh, an opportunity to write a humorous opinion. I like to do that, and that's totally different than writing another one. That's real play that you get involved in with that. But I've had some very serious ones that I've written with the, the foremost thought in mind that I'm covering my ass with the Court of Appeals. You know, I want to make sure that they, on that court, know what I did and why I did it. And that's, that's a different kind of thing than writing one that you want the general public to be aware of or the bar to be aware of. So there are different ways that you write, but uh, I would say that the main thing is I really like to write. I, I relax and I enjoy it. And my uh, lifelong experiences, uh, when you grow up in that kind of a house with all those aunts and uncles and cousins, the thing that you do is you don't make noise. And it was before television, you get a book. So I started reading in, when I was maybe four years old and it never stopped. I loved to read. So then I, I, I took all these courses in, uh, in college, in uh, uh, English, English Lit, creative writing, dramatic literature, uh, and then I also took a lot of philosophy courses and uh, a couple of uh, uh, political science courses as well. Uh, jurisprudence was taught by a magnificent teacher. I loved him. His name was Henry Ehrman, and he taught at CU, and then he went to Dartmouth, where he uh, taught for the rest of his career. But uh, I, I took constitutional law as an undergraduate and constitutional history, and so those in the philosophy courses. And what happens, I also took honors courses. So when you take honors courses, or at least in those days, you got one hour credit, and it was not based on an exam, but based on a paper. So you wrote a lot. And then by the time I was a senior, I was taking independent studies with professors one-on-one -on -one, uh, and writing papers for those, and I enjoyed it a great deal. And when I, uh, and I did some creative writing as well. So. By the time I got to uh, law school, writing was really just second nature to me. That's what I enjoyed doing the most. And uh, those oratorical contests I was in, and, uh, actually I wrote those out in advance. And it was the writing of them that made them as good as they were to win. So for that reason. So I, I, I think it comes naturally to me, or at least I like to do it. Uh, and it depends, as I say, you have to, it's the same thing in a courtroom as it is when you're writing an opinion. You have to size it up from not just one perspective. You have to look at it from different viewpoints. We'll get more into Irving Andrews later, but I want you to know that Irving always, and of course this is primarily because uh, he, he almost always represented defendants. He never did represent plaintiffs. Uh, but when his clients were served, he always, you know, looked at the complaint first, and then he went immediately from there to the jury instructions before he ever even thought about an answer. And that's a perspective that you, you know, you pick up on. If you're a trial judge, you have to see things from the viewpoint of the prosecutor, from the viewpoint of the defendant, and from defense counsel and then from the witnesses, and you have to size up the jury and see who you're, you know, I've had juries with three PhDs and two grade school graduates on the same jury. How do you talk to them? How do you explain things to them? So you take all these different things and then you come out with a, a certain way of, of writing. And so all the opinions aren't the same. They're not, there's no uh, key punch uh, to them. Each one is different.
but each one I tried to start out with a, a so-called hook. How do you begin the opinion so somebody wants to read it? And how do you finish it? So, but that's, I, I enjoy doing it. Um, when you first went on the bench in 1978, one of, the, one of the most significant cases assigned to you, which took you about 10 years to, to work through, uh, was a case involving the, uh, the uh, prison conditions at, in the Colorado State Penitentiary. The case was called Ramos versus Lamb. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're, you're a brand new judge. Uh, you have a controversial case which, uh, over the course of it, uh, not only generated a lot of press, but great consternation in the Colorado legislature. Uh, can, can you discuss yeah. what that case was about, what sure. your rulings were? It also made some, it, it had some national significance to it too. It is an oft-quoted uh, opinion now regarding attorney fees and how you calculate them. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, uh, this is a, a very good example of what we were talking about. First of all, when you, when you become a new judge, uh, the other judges on the bench take a percentage of their cases and reassign them to you. And the idea is that, it, for instance, if you have five judges and then another one on the bench, then you each one of them takes a, a, a fifth of their cases and transfers them to you so that each one of you and the, the new judge all have a, uh, an equal number of cases. And some judges will say, there's a new guy on the block, I'm gonna get rid of this junk I don't want. Uh, other judges are absolutely uh, m uh, saintly in saying, I'm going to give him stuff that a brand new judge can handle without too much problem. And then there are others that are just mechanics that just say, every fifth case, whatever it is, send it out. And they don't think twice about it. There are different variations of how you do that. But the consequence when I became a judge was I had, I had a little bit of that from all of them. Uh, one of them would give me some fairly easy cases, another one, but another one gave me some dogs. And the dogs, for the most part, for a judge, are pro se cases. There's, you're trying to find out what the person wants, and they're not trained in the law, so pro se for himself. And you try to figure out what it is, and you can't be an advocate for them, but at the same time, you can't just uh, be the queen of hearts and say off with their heads. You gotta, it, it really creates a problem. So judges are not particularly fond of getting pro se cases. They also tend to be cases that uh, that are emotionally squishy, if you can, if I can use that term. They, they, they're not the cut and dried stuff that has gone through a lawyer's trained mind and and come out in uh, in objective language. They, they have a lot of adverbs and they suffer a lot when they put stuff in and they, they lose their temper and uh, they say things that they can't prove and well, all sorts of things. So anyway, I got some good cases and I got some of these clinkers, uh, which were pro se prison cases. Now at that time, 40 years ago, we did not have pro se lawyers screening the cases. We didn't have magistrate judges uh, that would handle those cases. And we didn't have, as we do now, a senior judge that reviews all of these pro se dismissals that are done by the staff council. We, we, don't do, we didn't have that in those days. Each judge just got cases, whatever they were. So even though I had done a lot of criminal defense work and criminal appeals, I had never, and I'd done civil rights work uh, as a volunteer, but I had never ever gotten into prisoner rights or representing prisoners on, on conditions or something. I just didn't know anything about it. It's called 1983 under the Civil Rights Act. And I just never had any of those cases. So I was looking at how many I had, and I had two uh, law clerks to start with, so I said, what I want to do is uh, go through all these cases that are signed and, and do uh, 
home a, a kind of uh, triage and see which ones we need to pay more attention to. So I gave the law clerks that assignment to do, and of course all the pro se's end up in one stack. <laughs> and uh, this uh, one law clerk I had, Carolyn Carrasco, uh, she, she came in, she was all excited, and she says, Judge, this is a pro se case, but she says, she says, it's not a case to be dismissed. She said, he says that he's confined in 60 square feet of, uh, of a cell and the Tenth Circuit, here's a case that says that 72 square feet is the minimum. So here's a square footage, he states a claim for relief. That was Fidel Ramos. And I said to her, I didn't even, hadn't even seen the complaint, and I just said, well, I said, deny the motion to dismiss, draft it up. So she says, you know, a one-pager, he states a claim for relief, the state of Colorado's motion to dismiss is denied, file an answer in 20 days. And so I just, I didn't think anything more about it. Well, somebody thought more about it because in New York City, the American Civil Liberties Union had set up within the previous three or four months a huge program called the National Prison Project. And they saw that case, I, I, I don't know how they did, but whatever it was, maybe the local ACLU got it, sent them, whatever. But it was just, a, in those days also, we had a, a press that actually covered the courts. So the daily orders of federal judges in those days were published and uh, in the Denver Post, the Rocky Mountain News. So somebody could easily have picked it up and said, uh, you know, motion to dismiss, pro se prisoner case, Ramos versus Lamb denied, and something like that. At any rate, within a week, I had the National Defender Project in here, and they moved to enter their appearance on behalf of Fidel Ramos, and uh, the next thing they did was file a motion to uh, uh, amend it to make it a class action. And that's how I got the case. I literally had no idea, and it was, like you say, 10 years. I learned an awful lot about prison. This, this was your first year on the bench. Yeah, my <laughs> first year, when the, my first cases. And how, how did that case progress? What happened? Well, it was, uh, it was hotly contested, and uh, the, the lawyers in the case were, were all a, a pleasure to have, both the, uh, uh, the ACLU lawyers, were, and so were the uh, Assistant Attorneys General. We're, we're all a real pleasure to have. Uh, they, they worked like lawyers and, you know, as Shakespeare says, they stri strive mightily and then eat and drink as friends. And they were cordial. And, uh, to this day, I still, occasionally, I'll get a, uh, I, I got a birth announcement from one of the women lawyers that was on that case, and she had a daughter, and that daughter has now sent me a birth announcement. It just, uh, it goes back a long time. Jim Hartley, is a, he may be retired now, he's a partner at Holland and Hart, was one of the lawyers on that case. Uh, the Assistant Attorney General in charge of it was Joe DeRim, who then moved up to Boulder, and I think was city attorney, and uh, the, uh, his number two person was Richard Goldberg, who is the younger brother of my college classmate and friend Chuck Goldberg, who just retired. Uh, Tarquin Bromley was an assistant attorney general. He was my former investigator That's, on that case. I remember Tarquin Bromley, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, they, they, they were great, but the, uh, the attorney general at the time was J.D. McFarland, and uh, he was confronted with a very hostile, uh, he was a Democrat and the, the Senate was controlled by Republicans and Lamb was the governor. And uh, uh, McFarland uh, was dealing primarily with a, uh, a Republican Senator named Ralph Cole. And uh, th th there was a whole lot of hard feeling and vitriol. So I'm not too critical of McFarland when I say what I have to say, but those lawyers would be in court and they would say things to me, DeRim and Goldberg, 
about witnesses, you know, and we were saying, well, why are you calling that guy? You don't really need him and this sort of thing. And then they would go back to their office and then McFarland would have to appear in front of the Senate and he would go in there and tell the Senator Cole that they were doing everything they could to fight the case, but I was uh, determined, you know, and driving it and so on, to the extent that Cole came over and sat in the back of the courtroom when we had hearings. And uh, he uh, made some noises about trying to get me impeached and things like this. Uh, so, but I think, I think McFarland said things that were not accurate about what was going on in the courtroom. Certainly his appraisal of me was his opinion, but it wasn't based on anything I was doing. So, so the core issue were the various conditions of confinement at, at Old Max and in the penitentiary system writ larger? It was, it was health, safety, the safety of the officers as well as of the prisoners, the uh, process they were using to handle complaints, uh, certainly the medical care and the complete lack of mental health care that was going on. It was a totality of circumstances case. And the one cell house, they had seven, that I think had been built about the same time that uh, the Last Supper occurred. It was really old and dingy and they wouldn't, uh, and, they, and they kept people in there. And even their own expert prison architect said that it was not fit for uh, human habitation. And one of my orders was that that building's coming down. Nobody's going to stay there. Uh, but I went down to the prison, took my buddy Gorski with me as an expert advisor. Your buddy Gorski who had been a, a uh, he knew the inmate? Prison. Yes, yeah. He, he certainly knew that prison well. And uh, so, uh, but we went down and visited the, the prison and uh, we had, I think, five weeks of uh, t expert testimony. There were tons and tons of uh, briefs and books and articles that were filed, and I went through them all. Went through them all. And ultimately, uh, your, your ruling was what? Ultimately, my ruling was that the, uh, the state of Colorado was violating the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution by imposing cruel and unusual punishment on inmates at designated institutions that and I identified those and that they were the violations consisted of the denial of adequate medical care, a denial of space, uh, a denial of safety, and a uh, denial of safety for the guards as well. And uh, I, that's pretty much what I recall that it was. It was on the conditions themselves in the services. So uh, I ordered that one cell house to be shut down permanently. And then the remedy I gave was to give the state uh, a certain period of time to come forward with plans as to how to change it. And if they didn't, then I would, I would do it myself. And they did, they, they, brought, they went out and got experts and came back and they, they really redesigned the system a lot. And uh, irony of ironies, they had a, a warden down there at one time uh, named Harry Tinsley and the Colorado Correction Officers Association uh, has a, an award they give out every year called the Harry Tinsley Award and about, I want to say about 10 years, 10 or 15 years after the Ramos versus Lamb case, I received the Tinsley Award from the guards. But it took a long time for them to understand that the lack of safety was, you know, among other things, I mean, you look at these things uh, somewhat quantitatively, uh, the suicide rate of prisoners, the uh, self-mutilation rate, which is higher than suicide. You look at that. You look at the instances of diagnosed psychosis that take place during the, uh, the, the prison period of imprisonment. And another thing you look at is the health of the guards as to what they're doing, the rapid turnover or not. And, and if there's an increase in brutality, there's a 
a correlation between that and how the guards themselves are treated. They get angry, so they take it out on somebody else. And that. So there's a whole lot of complicating factors that, that, uh, that go into it. But the guards finally realized that the requirements I was making were for their benefit as well as for the inmates. And they had far, far fewer assaults on guards since, uh, since the Ramos case. Far fewer. What, what, one, of the, one of the interesting postscripts that's not really a postscript of that litigation is at the end of it, uh, you, uh, you, you wrote a, a very comprehensive opinion awarding attorney's fees to uh, the lawyers for the prisoners, uh, all of whom uh, volunteered for the duty. Right. Um, and uh, I think you mentioned earlier that that has had some presidential ramifications yes, yeah. nationwide to this day. I'll uh, tell you, you something funny about it, too. Uh, I wrote that opinion, and uh, we used to have these judges' meetings, uh, not like the ones that are taking place now. The, in the old days, we had these meetings where we discussed law, and we would discuss each other's opinions and what the Tenth Circuit was doing, the Supreme Court, etc. And so I wrote that opinion and circulated, and I came in, and Judge Raj was there, and he said, well, son, he said, uh, that's a lot of money that you, uh, uh, you just awarded those plaintiffs in that prison case. He said, uh, that's a lot more money than I awarded. And I said, well, Judge, I said it was, went to the Supreme Court of the United States. It was on appeal twice, and I said it was a five-week-long trial. And I said, there were six lawyers involved in that. I said, I don't think that whatever it was, I think a million two or something. Um, at my last read, it was eight hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars. Well, I think it went over a million, but at, at any rate, what, and and he says, no, no. He says, I'm not talking about that. He says, that's more attorney's fees than I've awarded my entire career. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and then Winter just looked over and says, welcome to the big time. He says, there, everybody in town is going to call you easy money from now on. <laughs> So, what, what were some of the significant... Well, the uh, significance of it is that I, I, I looked at, at, rather than a mathematical formula of just taking the number of hours spent and uh, the hourly rate, you know, and coming out with uh, what the, they call that the capstone or... The lodestar. Load, the lodestar. And I, I jumped that. And I said, we're going to look at the, the fundamental good that they did and the individual cases, the, the, the challenges, the unusual aspects of the law and so on. And I put all of that together. And so I justified their spending more time on research than, uh, than would normally be done. And there's a, another case that I followed, uh, Georgia Highway Express, I think is the name of it, that deals with attorney's fees but it uses the lodestar. And what I, what I did was I said that we, we are not looking at, at how much a legal aid lawyer gets for handling something. We're gonna look and see what this is worth on a general economic basis. So that, that's essentially what happened. But I, I did it in such a systematic way that that's what's followed, that the Tenth Circuit basically accepted everything I did. Logan wrote that opinion, and I think he disapproved of one or two things I said. Uh, but then it went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court affirmed. We've been going for another two hours. So would yeah. you like to take no. the day off and start again tomorrow? If you want to, it's up to you. Let's ask our assistant. Whatever you guys want to do, I mean, if you want to go. You want to go to four? 20 more minutes, or? What time is Maybe it? Three fifteen. Three thirty. All right, let's go to three thirty. Okay. Uh, if you guys are okay with it, I don't want to. No, I'm fine with it. I'm, I, uh, I'm, my sole, sole function here is to be the conductor. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, three thirty works. <laughs> and call the call the whistle stops. Okay. Uh, uh, that, that, that's that's a good segue to uh, a, a case where you get. Uh, you got reversed by the United States Supreme Court in, in, uh, uh, in a matter that uh, was pretty profound in terms of uh, 
adjudicating what kind of grand jury practices can and uh, will be tolerated by the judiciary. Yeah. And, and in the case that uh, I referred to is the Bank of Nova Scotia case, right. Kilpatrick. Yeah. Um, that's a case that uh, you you had fairly early on in your judicial career in the 1980s. Right. Uh, could you describe that, what the issues sure. were and, and uh, how it all came out? Well, uh, it's, uh, you know, you get reversed by the Supreme Court and by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. It makes you somewhat, it's somewhat humbling and you think maybe I was wrong, but I really don't think I was in that case, but I was outvoted significantly so. Uh, Kilpatrick was a, an extraordinarily difficult kind of person to have in court. And uh, he was a uh, tax protester, a tax evader, and he was part of a national uh, movement to, uh, to avoid paying income taxes and encourage other people not to pay their income taxes. And uh, the, not the local uh, U.S. attorney, but the attorneys at what they euphemistically referred to as Maine Justice uh, had that case. And uh, their, uh, their conduct was, uh, in preparing that case, it was in, in my view and in the view of others as well, including Judge Winner, who had something to do with uh, Kilpatrick later on, but uh, it was unconscionable. Uh, as an example, they had a, uh, a PhD in taxation from, I believe it was the University of Washington who came before the grand jury and testified, and uh, he uh, disagreed with the theory that this prosecutor from Washington had, and the prosecutor from Washington told him that uh, he would never testify again and that he was going to destroy his credibility, and if he didn't change his opinion, you know, he was going to recommend his removal from the faculty and all this kind of stuff going after this witness. Uh, he had hearings in which he was insulting to the uh, witnesses, and he had uh, people that uh, were to be called, and he that, that could say something favorable for Kirkpatrick, and uh, he he wouldn't call. Him. It was just I can't I can't even begin to think now. It's been so long, but the, it was just it wasn't just one act of misconduct. It was, uh, uh, I think I used the term that he had converted the grand jury into a rubber stamp and that the grand jury could not fulfill its obligations under the statutes and the Constitution to, uh, to examine this the way it was done and so on. And so I dismissed the case on the grounds of prosecutorial misconduct before the grand jury. So, uh, that was appealed, and Judge Holloway wrote the opinion and said uh, his ruling was that reversing me, saying that any, he didn't challenge my findings of misconduct, but he said that any misconduct performed in front of a grand jury was absolved by having a pettit jury hear the evidence and hear the case. So that it was beyond the authority of a trial judge to dismiss a case on the basis of misconduct by the prosecution in front of the grand jury. You could dismiss for prosecutorial misconduct in front of a pettit jury, but not the grand jury. So uh, I had ruled that I thought it was part of my supervisory responsibilities as a judge to control the uh, conduct of the government before the grand jury. But they said, well, you you have that authority, but not to dismiss the case. So I, I can't recall exactly how the Bank of Nova Scotia came into the case, but they were the, they were the bank that Kirkpatrick, I think, was using. And they had lawyers that were here in the court at the time. Uh, so 
I think they settled eventually, the bank did. But I think they were co-defendants in the original prosecution. I think though. that's right, yeah. And so then, uh, but Kirkpatrick, uh, uh, he went to trial and I think he went to prison. Right. How did the United States... He wrote States a book, by the way, and I know I was mentioned in his book, but uh, I don't know where it is now, but he, he uh, Fred Winter and I were both men mentioned in uh, Kirkpatrick's book. How, how, did, Patrick. how did the United States Supreme Court uh, take that up? Was they, it after his conviction? Uh, well, they took it up with Bank of Nova Scotia, and I think that, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how that happened. I know that uh, th their opinion was, as Scalia, that uh, it doesn't matter what happens in front of the grand jury because once you have a pettit jury, they we only review the conviction on the basis of what was done at the trial. The, the, the effect of those opinions, uh, those appellate opinions, um, appears to be to this day that uh, federal grand jury practices, no matter how abusive, can't be reviewed by the judiciary. Is That's that right. Read? That's the way I read it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it, it just encourages a police state. Uh, one, one other case uh, of significance that I want to ask you about that occurred during your first ten years after you were sworn in. I, I sort of segment your career into, yeah. <laughs> into ten, ten year increments. For decades. Yeah. Pretty we, soon we'll have a rosary. Well, we, we'll get to the, the decade starting in 1988 yeah. tomorrow. Um, but that, that involves uh, a, uh, a criminal defendant named O'Driscoll, O-D-R-I-S-C-O-L-L. Um, and uh, he, he's someone who you're sentenced to 325 years in prison. Right. Um, and and that, that case was controversial, uh, not only because of the term, but because of uh, the circumstances. Could you describe that? Sure. Uh, it was a particularly uh, horrid uh, crime spree that O'Driscoll was on. And among other things that happened, he, uh, he went into a gun store in Lakewood with a gun he wanted to, to uh, pawn, and the, the owner of the store said that he didn't have a license for that. And so O'Driscoll took this 44 Magnum revolver and pistol whipped this guy to such an extent that uh, his fingers were flayed. In other words, they were so broken that they came together. They just turned into mush. Uh, he then left there and he had a, a, a go-go dancer with him. And they went to a shopping center in, uh, in uh, Lakewood, uh, the JCRS Shopping Center. And there was a guy, uh, a Vietnam veteran in the Navy who uh, sold uh, window sashes, window frames and things. And he, he had a, uh, uh, a little van. And he had, would take his samples around uh, like Pella, windows that people install in construction. And so he would take those around, and so he had stopped for the day and went into Jocelyn's to get his wife a birthday present. Now, I point this out because Jocelyn's is sort of a, you know, a very low-priced, very uh, economy sort of place that people go. It is not uh, one of the fancy places in, in the Cherry Creek Mall. And Jocelyn's is sort of a Walmart kind of store. And so here's this guy buying his wife a present at a store that he can afford to go to. And he comes back out and uh, O'Driscoll is in the car, a stolen car, with his go-go uh, dancer and with the firearms and things he's taken out of the store that he's just beaten this poor guy into insensibility. And uh, grabs this guy, throws him in the van, 
puts the rest of his stuff in the van and takes off. And they go across the state line into uh, Kansas. And he goes to this small town in Kansas and he tells the, the girlfriend to go into this drive-by, whatever, you know, some hamburger joint. And she says, what are you gonna do with him? And this guy's been saying, look, just leave me alone. I'll just, I, I, you can have the, the van, just leave me alone and so on. And she testified to all that. But anyway, he says, I'll take care of it. I'm gonna drop him off out of town. So she goes in and he takes this guy out to the outskirts of this small town in Kansas. And the guy crawls on the ground and O'Driscoll comes up and shoots him seven or eight times. And the last wound is a contact wound in the back of his head that comes out his face. So then he gets back in the car and he picks up the, uh, the woman and she says, where is he? I let him go, he says. And so they, they go on to Connecticut and he robs a bank along the way and then they get to Connecticut and he robs a savings and loan and uh, then he goes, he gets rid of the van and he, he cleans it all up, except he forgets that he had adjusted the rear view mirror and his fingerprint is on the, the back side of the rear view mirror. So he leaves that, steals another car, and he goes in further into Connecticut and he goes into a small town and he robs a savings and loan. And then he's in a, a motel and he takes these sashes from the wall of the motel and he's at the savings and loan, he's kidnapped this older woman and he takes her into this hotel room and he ties her up and then uh, he leaves and uh, uh, leaves her for dead. She happened to live, but he left her like that. And then he goes on a crime spree robbing banks and savings and loan and he ends up in uh, Oregon where uh, he's trying to buy thousands of dollars worth of marijuana and he's arrested, and when he's arrested, he has uh, uh, automatic weapons and uh, a whole display of them. That he photographs him with all these weapons, and he's got a little sign, I think, says "Public Enemy Number One," that kind of thing. So anyway, they arrest him, and they they're going to do something to him in uh, in Oregon or Washington State. I think it was Oregon, and. But, but he was awaiting trial here, so they bring him back here, and I get the case. And the, the prosecutor, the state prosecutor in Kansas, uh, advises the prosecutor here that he's not going to prosecute him to cost too much money uh, for a murder case when the victim wasn't a resident, neither was the defendant, so why should they bother about it as long as he's being prosecuted here? So in a way, he's getting away with murder there, attempted murder along the way. And th then I find after he's found guilty that he, uh, he was suspected of having killed somebody else. He had beaten up his uh, father. He uh, had uh, committed a, a whole string of other crimes. And uh, he'd made threats about people that when he got out, he was going to do things to, to people. So uh, anyway, he went to trial. He had a court-appointed lawyer. He was found guilty. The evidence was overwhelming about his uh, guilt. And I remember the owner of the gun store coming in and testifying with his hands mangled the way they were for the rest of his life. And the stripper, or go-go girl, she testified. And uh, so, I was, he was charged with kidnapping, but not murder in my, in, in my court. And the penalty for kidnapping uh, at that time said any term of years to life. And the practice by the U.S. Bureau of Prisons was the same as with the Bresnahan thing. If you serve 10 years of a life sentence, you became eligible for, uh, to be considered for parole. And I wanted to make damn sure that this guy wasn't out in 10 years time. So 
I looked at the statute and it says any term of years or life, not to life or life. And so I figured that he, that there was another statute that said that the judge can fix the term of imprisonment as long as it does not exceed one third of the maximum sentence. That's the way the statute wrote at that time. So I sentenced him to 325 years because that meant that he would have to do 103 years before he would be eligible for release. So what I was trying to do was give him a life sentence without parole that, that related to the murder case, related to the bankruptcy, related to the maiming and all these other things that he had done. And so the case went up on appeal and uh, it was uh, Judge Barrett affirmed uh, in a, almost by return mail and it went, uh, they, he petitioned for certiorari. Now, I have to interrupt myself to tell you one funny thing that happened. When I sentenced him to 325 years, his court-appointed lawyer was a guy named Ike Kaiser, and Ike looks and he says, 325 years? Judge, my client can't do 325 years. And I said, just tell him to do what he can. <laughs> That's all we care about. So, at any rate, it, it goes up uh, on petition for cert. We had at that time, a, a splendid U.S. attorney, one of the best I, in, in my lifetime I've ever known, Bob Miller. And Bob Miller was in Washington, uh, and uh, I'm trying to th think of uh, what the guy's name was. The attorney general was uh, Reagan's lawyer. The, he'd been a- Ed Meese. Ed Meese. And so Miller is back at Maine Justice, going around and seeing how his cases from Colorado are doing and so forth. And he goes into the Solicitor General's office, and I think it was this professor from Harvard named Freed was the mm -hmm. uh, uh, Solicitor General. And he says, I'm Bob Miller, I'm from Colorado, what are you doing? And he says, oh, he says, we're just getting ready to uh, confess the petition for cert on this O'Driscoll case. And Miller says, come again? And he says, well, yeah, he said, uh, he said, that judge, he says, has just usurped the authority of the Bureau of Prisons and they're mad as hell because they think that the statute gives them the discretion as to when to release people and they ought to be able to decide when O'Driscoll leaves. And by setting it up the way this judge did, he's gonna do 103 years before he's eligible for release. So we wanna confess error and uh, or confess the, the certiorari petition and ask them to uh, reverse it because the judge has abused his discretion. And Miller said, stop right there. And he turned around and walked away and he went into Mises' office. This is Miller telling me this story. And he walks in and Mises is busy on other stuff. And he said, what do you want? And he says, I just want you to know that he says, a Carter appointee has sentenced a murdering bank robber to 325 years, and your solicitor general from Harvard wants to confess the petition and confess error. And he said, Meese looked at him and said, Jesus, H. Christ, and he yelled at his secretary, get me freed on the phone. He says, don't, no, wrong, no. <laughs> so it was, cert was denied but it came that close. Uh, not because of the merits, but because the bureaucrats in the Bureau of Prisons didn't like somebody uh, in, you know, interfering with their discretion. And as I recall, your judgment uh, had, had sort of tragic verification when O'Driscoll murdered someone else in prison. Is That's that right. right. I said in the opinion that he was, was likely to kill again and I sent a letter to the Bureau of Prisons saying this man is one of the most dangerous I've ever encountered in my career. And uh, they put him into uh, a prison up in, uh, in Pennsylvania where they make baseball bats at Kingsport. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he killed a prisoner there. And I'll tell you about that. He joined a gang in prison, an Aryan gang. And there, 
they, they had no smoking rules on the first tier of a, uh, of a cell house. And there was a guy that was in, who had asthma, and he was in the no smoking tier, and he had a single cell. And somebody in the Aryan nation wanted that cell. So they sent O'Driscoll uh, into the cell and said, told the guy, he says, you get out of here, we want this cell for one of our people. And the guy said, look, I'm going to be released in two weeks and I can't live up there with all that smoke. I've got asthma. And O'Driscoll just took out a knife and killed him. And so they had him charged with murder and uh, they sought the death penalty because he was already serving this term. And uh, I was subpoenaed and I went back and testified. And testified, yeah, this is the guy and this is what he did, and I basically relate this story in the old Driscoll opinion. And uh, so he was found guilty of that murder, and the jury was qualified for the death penalty, and they were out for two weeks, and they finally came back as a hung jury uh, 11 to 1 for, uh, for the death penalty, but one person held out. And the reason she held out was because his daughter, who he'd never met, sent letters to him. And so that's why he wasn't executed. So they transferred him to Florence. And I believe he's still an AX. In Florence? In Florence, Colorado. I was told at one time that I think he was in, uh, uh, I, it was either Leavenworth or the, uh, the maximum security unit they had in Ohio, uh, near Terre Haute, it was a big time thing. And he was in one of those high security prisons and they brought him in and said, well, uh, what are you gonna do if you get out? You're not eligible for a release, but what would happen if you got out? And he said, I'd get a bus ticket and I'd go to Denver and I'd go to the courthouse and I'd kill Judge Kane. Well, it's a good thing you got 325 years. <laughs> we're, we're at 330, so All right. why don't we call it? Um, that's O'Driscoll. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an extraordinary story, too. Oh, there's one, one other thing on that. Dick Spriggs, who is, was a career prosecutor and later a judge and so on, and he came up to me after the O'Driscoll case was over with, and he said, uh, talk about hitting a high-hanging curveball out of the ballpark he said, that one was really just handed to you. And I said, come on. I said, that was a tough thing to do. And he says, well, it certainly got rid of your reputation as being soft on crime. <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you. And we'll adjourn again. All right. Till 10.